Welcome. Welcome to Move to Learn, the hand, handspring webinar series for manual therapists and movement educators. Our guests today are co-authors Neem Maloney and Marnie Hartman. They are the authors of Pain Science, Yoga, Life. Before introducing Neem and Marnie, let's take a look at the slide that explains how things work, how you can, what you can expect from the webinar. The webinar will comprise roughly 45 minutes of discussion, presentation, and guided practice that's followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. The chat is on, so do say hello and tell us where you're joining from. We welcome your questions and ask that you use the, the Q&A button on your screen. Uh, although we will finish on the hour, uh, we may continue for an additional 10 minutes um, in order to answer all your questions. The webinar is being recorded and we'll share a link to it in the follow-up email. The webinar is also streaming live on YouTube, so you can join us there. We bring your attention to a disclaimer that this discussion is for informational and illustrative purposes only and is not meant to impart medical or therapeutic advice or instruction. So we refer you to uh, the book, uh, Pain Science, Yoga, Life, Bridging Neuroscience and Yoga for Pain Care. Now an introduction to our guests to Neem Maloney uh, and Marnie Hartman. Neem Maloney is a PhD in physical therapy. She's a specialist in musculoskeletal physiotherapy, a yoga teacher, and a pain researcher. Neve practices in the Channel Islands and also holds an honorary fellow position with uh, Macquarie University in Sydney, where she was previously a senior lecturer. Neve is a passionate advocate of evidence-based practice and has over 50 peer-reviewed publications from her pain-related research. Her increasing appreciation of how yoga philosophy and practices can help address some of the complex aspects of pain and its care has led her to integrate yoga into her clinical practice and has ultimately inspired the writing of this book. Neve runs pain education and yoga courses for people with persistent pain and teaches widely to healthcare professionals. Marnie Hartman is a doctor of physical therapy, a certified strength and conditioning specialist, and a registered yoga teacher. Her drive for compassionate, authentic interactions and connection to the good in all humans and the wild led her to a simple life and challenging practice in the Bush community of Haines, Alaska. It was here that she first developed an interest in learning how to care for those in persistent pain. Marnie quickly realized the supportive container yoga held for people engaging in pain care. She has incorporated pain science education and yoga as part of her clinical care and teaching for nearly a decade. Marnie owns and operates a private physical therapy and yoga practice and has been an instructor for the International Sp Spine and Pain Institute and an education contributor for yoga medicine. You are in for a treat with this handspring webinar given that you will learn an inspiring story about how these two expert uh, co-authors found each other across, across um, global travels and time change. Neve and Marnie, welcome to Move to Learn. Thanks so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks for having us. I'm just going to um, <clears throat> share my screen here for everybody to see. And I'll tell you a little story about how Neve and I first met. Oh, let me get back to the beginning here. <laughs> so I remember quite clearly um, meeting Neve uh, in 2010. We were at an international um, conference on the study of pain. 
And she introduced me to elderflower water. We were sitting next to each other at a table um, at a dinner event for the conference. And we just very quickly became um, friends. You know, there was a connection of, of kindred spirits that was um, kind of felt right away. We stayed in touch for a few years and then we met up again in 2012 uh, at a follow up conference in Adelaide, Australia. And it was there that the conversation first began that um, kind of uh, led us to, to a few more years, <laughs> maybe eight <laughs> process yeah. of coming to the place to actually put um, some words on paper. And that turned into pain science yoga life, which is really a passion project. It's a passion project between the two of us who have um, really a very different skill set and a very different um, driving force behind it. Uh, but I think the blend shows that um, we have something very much in common and that is this um, compassion for uh, those who are suffering from persistent pain and understanding the mecha mechanisms behind it and how to um, bring science into a tangible form so people can actually shift their pain experience. So the book itself uh, really um, highlights uh, the two of us first working through um, the evidence and um, the, the, the base that, that is behind how pain works. Um, it goes through the foundations of the yoga practice using the eight limbs as our guide and connecting them directly into um, these ideas of pain. We include some um, Buddhist philosophies and, and kind of loose Buddhist uh, psychologies in the third chapter as, and this too, uh, which we're gonna walk through a little bit of a, a, a sampling of that today. We show you clearly um, a case study that then follows through all the rest of the chapters. Um, and each one of those give you uh, a scientific foundation through the headspace. Uh, then we take you out of the head and onto the mat and then finally off the mat and into life. So today is really um, gonna be just uh, uh, like the snow <laughs> on top of an iceberg of what this book offers for you. Um, so this is just a little image um, that Neve and I developed. It's called the Pain and Yoga Mandala. And we're gonna visit it quite a bit today. Uh, each petal that's listed there, thoughts and beliefs, emotions, physical aspects, and so on, represent um, the title of the chapters in the second section of the book. The outside of the mandala is your eight limbs and the inside represents um, the processing and systems that come together um, as this integration of um, what eventually becomes our experience of pain um, and also our experience of, of ourselves. So, uh, we know that Neve um, is, is very rooted in, in the scientific evidence of things. And I am quite rooted in, in how to take that into the clinic um, and into um, direct care for a patient, which means that I myself have to know how to take this into practice. So that's my challenge for each of you today is to take the examples that we give and pull them into your own life and see if you can take these little practices and maybe shift a bit of your own experience um, to see what it's like to walk the bridge from the things that happen in our head and the science in our body through practice and all the way into life. So thank you so much for joining us today or tuning in later. And um, let's go on a little journey today. We're gonna take it from practice to science and then back to practice again. So here's a Buddhist parable. The Buddha says, if you got struck with a dart, is it painful? The student answers, well, yes. And the Buddha inquires further, if you got struck with a second dart, is it more painful? Yes, it is, answers the student. The Buddha went on to explain, in life, we cannot control the first dart. However, the second dart is our re reaction to the first. And with this second one comes the possibility of a choice. So what wisdom is the Buddha really offering the student here? If we think of it in a very simple, maybe everyday example that's more emotionally loaded, we can, we can think about, um, like say my boyfriend comes home late for dinner. That could be a dart, right? It's a little bit of a stimulus. 
I can react to that by saying, I'm so glad you're okay. Welcome, there's dinner, right? Or I can react to it and say, I can't believe that you don't appreciate how much effort I put into making this meal. And that explodes into a place of potential suffering. So what does that have to do with pain? If we look specifically at the definition of pain, the International Association for the Study of Pain defines it as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. It's associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. That's kind of a lot right there. But if we untangle it a little bit, we can see that what it's telling us is pain can be experienced with or without tissue damage. And pain is a sensory and emotional experience that is the product of many layers of processing. And it's ultimately the output of the brain as a means to protect. So if we take that and we combine it with this idea of the darts, can we go through just a simple um, practice? So I'll invite you now to either just kind of form a comfortable seat wherever you are, or potentially move to a mat on the floor and lay on your back. But the idea here is to just start to settle in and begin to either close your eyes or soften your gaze. Take a nice, long, slow inhale through your nose and then exhale completely out through the nose. Try to keep the breath steady, allowing it to be full and complete. And if you can bring your awareness to your whole body, just an open scan using a broad lens. Can you begin to notice any physical sensation that may be present? Maybe acknowledge it and name it sensation or dart one. As you feel and note the sensation, can you note thoughts, emotions, or beliefs that seem to be linked directly to it. Can you separate the sensation and the thought? Sensation, first dart. Thought, second dart. Even if these thoughts seem harmless, identifiers like stiffness or ache, pressure, dullness, they still become additives. So for now, imagine they can be pulled away from the sensory stimulus. Letting your breath continue to guide this open awareness of the body, Can you find a sensation? First start. And choose to let that be all that is present. If a belief or emotional feeling is connected to the sensation, gently include it and name it second dart. If you become distracted, just come back to your breath. Anchor in the inhale and the exhale and return to the open scan. Noting a sensation, allowing it to be there alone. Noting what might be added to it, 
include it, name it, and set it aside. I'll let you take one final big inhale and exhale. And then you can return, blinking your eyes open or bringing your gaze back to the screen in front of you. So what you can see there, what we did is just, we took a body scan. It's a very simple, basic mindfulness practice that's often included in yoga. We paired it with the theme of the parable of the darts. So this gave us a focus for that body scan. And our aim is just to explore the sensations softening our emotions through the soothing sense of our breath. And we're maintaining a certain place of focus, observing darts and separating them. So what does this really have to do with the neurobiology of pain and the sensory experience? And how come sometimes darts come uh, very dull and leave it much, not much of an impact? And sometimes they come incredibly sharp and leave a giant impact and maybe a splattering of a blizzard of follow-up of darts. So I'm gonna turn it over to Neve and she's gonna walk you back to the headspace side of this bridge and talk to us about the neuroscience of pain. Thank you so much, Marnie, for that. Um, and I think that lovely bringing us into this space and I think that quietening of, our, of ourselves and our bodies um, is great preparation as we now start to stimulate our brains a little bit more and, um, and come into this space around the neuroscience of pain. And what, what is it about pain that means that we can all experience pain in very different and varied ways? So I think when we start to get into the headspace here, into the neuroscience, it's really critical that we approach it from this perspective that pain relies in context. We're going to look at some of the component parts of pain, um, of what makes it up in, in our nervous system. But the context within which we experience these different components is really crucial. Um, and so I'd like to share two stories with you to thread through the next few slides as we talk about the science. And the first is, um, it's a personal story. So a few years ago, I moved to Guernsey and I took up offshore rowing. Um, I had rowed before, but I had never done offshore rowing. And it's a bit of a different beast. So you've got bigger boats and the, um, uh, you've got to get the boats down the slipway, off these trolleys and into the water, and you've got to do the same on the way out. Um, and oftentimes you're, you're wrestling with the swell and you're getting kind of juggled about quite a bit. So the next day after rowing, I'd wake up and I'd see all these bruises on my legs that I had never registered getting in the first place. And I was like, oh, isn't that interesting? This is kind of an example where the context in this situation means that I'm not experiencing pain, even though clearly I'm having some tissue insults. So that's on one side of the coin. Let's look at another side of that. Um, and I'd like to tell you about um, a patient, a lady that I saw um, about 15 years ago. So I tell her story a lot because she has really stayed with me and left quite a lasting impression. Um, Mary is a lady um, who had a 10 year history of, of back pain and, and came to see me. Um, she had severe back pain and disability um, associated with her back pain. And she told me that 10 years earlier, she had bent down and experienced excruciating pain. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and that she was subsequently told that um, her pain was related to a disc protrusion and she was advised not to bend. And in 10 years, Mary had not bent her spine. Um, that's a long time to not bend. And she had become really disabled because of this. Um, to, to, we, we then went into our physical evaluation. And, um, and, and let me tell you a little bit about that. I want you just to experience this for a moment. If you put your hands on your pelvis um, and just do a very gentle pelvic tilt. 
So if you roll your pelvis backwards, like you're just gonna go into the slightest lump and come back off that again. Maybe do that two or three times. Now I'm guessing that most of you, when you do that movement, feel that it's a very gentle movement, or maybe if you've got some aches and pains, it might feel a bit stiff, or you have a sensory experience around it. Um, but most people don't experience that as excruciating. But Mary did. She had a really profound pain response to that very gentle movement. She also had a really marked stress response. So she started perspiring and her heart rate was going crazy or her breath rate was going crazy. So almost to the point of having like a panic attack going into this movement. So how is it? What do we know about the nervous system? That we can have these two extreme responses, essentially. One to not feel it at all and one to have this, this really, really profound response. So let's move into the nervous system. This is a bit of a busy slide, don't get too put off. We're gonna, we're gonna step you through it. Um, so on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see the peripheral nerves and you've got a bunch of different nerve fiber types. So that's how some sensory information gets into our nervous system. In the middle, we've got a representation of the spinal cord. And then at the top, we've got um, the, uh, an image of the brain. And so there'll be changes within our central nervous system that ramp up or ramp down these signals. And there's a whole bunch of processing that happens in our brain. So if we start looking at some of these peripheral inputs, um, you don't really need to know the names of the fibers, but I'm gonna to refer to them to illustrate what, what kind of sensory input we get when we um, have different stimuli that, that um, uh, input into our, into our tissues. So to illustrate, can you take your thumb and I'm gonna ask you to, if you wanna do this, just to give your thumb a little wiggle. So you've now activated A alpha nerve fiber types. Okay, these A alpha fibers um, send us information or relay information into our nervous system about movement um, and about where our body is in space. Okay, next, give your thumb a nice little stroke. <laughs> um, just touch it lightly. You're now activating A beta nerve fiber types. These are ones that send information about non-noxious mechanical stimuli like light touch or um, like vibration. Okay. If you like, go ahead and give your thumbnail a fairly firm pinch, not a, not the extreme, but just firmly clasp your thumb. Now, as you increase the pressure, A delta fibers will be activated and relaying that information about more intense, potentially noxious, so potentially uh, nociceptive information into your nervous system. Interestingly, these fibers also send signals about heat and cold. If you're game and you want to know a bit more about the fourth nerve fiber type, take your fingernails and give the tip of your, your thumb, the skid on the tip of your thumb, a little pinch and, you know, give it a bit more of a squeeze. You'll start to notice that that's maybe quite unpleasant. You're now activating some C fibers. They pick up on these kind of more nociceptive or noxious inputs, inputs that kind of trigger a warning signal. As Marnie said at the start, you know, the pain we experience is an experience. It's not the sensory, we don't have pain signals per se, we've got warning signals and we get sens sensory input into our tissue, from our tissues into our nervous system, but it's not pain at this point. And so if we come back to my experience and, and Mary's experience and relate that to what was happening, we can see that, well, I was getting lots of A delta and C fiber activation. I was getting lots of noxious input, but wasn't actually experiencing pain at all. For Mary, she was just doing a little pelvic tilt. She was probably just getting some A alpha fiber activity that shouldn't even have been producing much pain, but she was getting a profound pain experience. So if we just look at sensory inputs, it doesn't help us explain the extremes of these um, experiences. We need to delve further and come into set thinking about central sensitization and inhibition. So um, if we take our attention to the spinal cord um, and indeed into the central nervous system, so up to the brain as well, our nerves communicate with one another through gaps 
synapses. And at those synapses, activity can get ramped up, turned up or turned down. So something was happening in my nervous system that those signals coming in were getting turned down. Something's happening in Mary's nervous system that means that that information about movement is getting ramped up and is accessing um, her nociceptive system is starting to be registered as pain. And so many of you will be familiar with this term sensitization. Um, and that's what we're talking about, plasticity within the nervous system. If we start to look at the brain then, um, we start to see that lots of different areas in our brain are activated when we have a pain experience. And so areas that are related to sensation, so the sensory cortexes, areas related to movement, our motor cortexes, um, our thinking part of our brain, so the prefrontal cortex, our emotional brain, the limbic system, all activated when we have a pain experience. And importantly, they're all also communicating with this bit of our brain um, down at the brainstem that we kind of know is our brain pharmacy. And our brain pharmacy releases chemicals that help to calm things down. So you'll be familiar with some of these. They're like endorphins, serotonin. Um, some of you might also be familiar with things like GABA, um, endocannabinoids. They're all chemicals that have the potential to calm down the nervous system. They can also do the opposite. So by either not and releasing those chemicals, or indeed releasing chemicals that sensitize um, the nervous system, they can ramp up those signals. Um, so if we come back to the examples, to my example and Mary's example, we can see that in my nervous system, I'm so concentrated on the task at hand, you know, getting that boat out of the water and negotiating it um, up the slipway and trying to make sure that like, I, you know, we don't damage the boat or that, you know, all, all of our crew are, are kept safe. That my brain is giving me a heavy hit of endorphins. And so I don't register these bashes that I'm getting on my legs because they're not so important in this context. For Mary, the opposite is happening in many ways. So her brain, her thinking brain is going, bending's really dangerous. I've been told that bending's really dangerous and that this might cause another disprotrusion. Her fear centers, her limbic system, her emotional brain is going off as well at the same time. She's having this really strong stress response. She's terrified of more pain. She's terrified of more damage. She's terrified of another 10 years like the last 10 years. And all of this will be influencing her brain pharmacy and her brain and, and telling her brain pharmacy, hey, no, don't release those pain relieving chemicals. You need to feel this, this is really important. So all of this processing in our brain leads to different outputs or responses. We can see two really different responses in the cases that, you know, we talk about those two examples, but maybe if you reflect now on, on your experience when you did the body scan, you might have noticed multiple responses. And certainly Marnie cued you into experience sensations um, to register whether you have some emotions or thoughts or beliefs that kind of are carried alongside those physical sensations. You might have noticed that there was some movement um, um, or bracing type pattern. So you weren't doing anything in that pattern, but um, maybe you noticed that there was some tension or tightness or a breath holding that, so there might have been a movement response that was happening that you noticed. Maybe there was a stress response. Um, it could be a, a fight or flight response that we kind of saw with, um, with Mary, or sometimes we see these freeze responses as well. So we start to get into this picture where you might have experienced many, many of these. We've got multiple responses as part of this fuller experience. And so then if we look back at that mandala, and we look back to our pain and yoga mandala and we start to pull all of this back together, we can see how all of these petals, these thoughts and beliefs and emotions and so on, feed into our nervous system and, and start to be processed and integrated in kind of this circular way. Um, and so it's, this is where we get the choice to untangle things a little bit more. Um, we've chosen some of these, these inputs. Um, one, is, one is because they lie in our scope of practice, but the other is that there's a lot of research um, around these different elements that um, we know increase pain sensitivity. 
Um, so, so like if we take something like sleep, for example, we know that sleep disturbance is something that increases pain processing. Um, and, and this is sort of a, <laughs> a funny one for me because I've got a two year old who doesn't really sleep that wonderfully well. And so I could probably count on my hands the number of um, times I've had a consolidated night's sleep in the last two years. Um, and I know that my pain sensitivity, because we test it when we do teach some of our teaching and courses and things, that my pain sensitivity is almost half what it was um, pre-Freya. So, um, so the, the, the research sort of supports this as well. And that's why we've looked at, at these particular elements. And so when we come into pain care then, it makes sense. And I think that's a bit, it makes sense now for us to start to look at something that's a more holistic container, or at least gives us a container that we can draw different elements from so that we can offer kind of more multidimensional care um, or support more multidimensional care for people in pain. So there's the science bit. We're going to head back now into a little bit more about yoga and a little bit more into the practice. So I'll pass back to Marnie to do that. Thanks, Neve. So before we leave this uh, pain and yoga mandala, I just want to walk you through um, kind of specifically how it can be used as a little bit of a roadmap. Um, maybe for yourself, if you're processing some, some physical sen sensations that um, are landing maybe harder than you think they should be or staying longer, or if you're working with somebody who, who is. So um, I'll, I'll choose a personal story of my own. Um, about five years ago, I was going through a rather emotional um, breakup from a partner who I'd been with for um, over a decade. And um, I was, leaning hard into my own physical yoga practice as a soothing place. Um, but that also meant that I was trying to soothe myself by um, kind of maybe stoking my own ego a little bit and doing some postures that were a bit uh, too advanced for where I was at that stage. And so I had um, taken myself into like a scorpion style handstand. So if you're not familiar, handstand with your feet coming over towards your head, and somebody walked into the room and it startled me and I lost my focus and I basically crumbled to the floor. So that was like a first dart stimulus to my back, right? Um, the second dart stimulus is that came or stimuli that came along with that um, was this very heightened sensitive place of emotions that I was in. Um, my sleep was definitely uh, disturbed. I had moved out of my house and was sleeping in a yurt, which is a fancy tent. Um, I was dealing with uh, kind of living right into the elements. Um, my thoughts and beliefs about myself and who I was and how I worked in the world were being threatened by this transitioning time of that partnership. Um, and my perception, my, my, my sense of self uh, was really being called into, into question on what I wanted to do. Um, and I was exercising maybe too much. And so my body was breaking down. Um, and that means that this, you know, this handstand fall event uh, started to, to grow into um, difficulty to even walk because of the pain in my back. So I can look at this mandala personally and go, there are areas here that feeding in to the central system, our nervous system, our immune system, our endocrine system, as me just sort of walked you through. And they're ramping up the stimulus to make it a bigger actual physical sensation. But on the other side, I can also look at these petals and say that they're little avenues in on places that I can start to kind of pull that whole um, scenario down a little bit. So if I start to look at just my thoughts and beliefs, can I recognize what's there that's helpful and what's there that's not helpful, right? What's a dart? And then what's a second dart? If I can start to pull those apart, I have a place in to soothe myself and maybe change some of my physical sensations. And as care providers, this is a way that, that we, can, we can do that. And the great news is um, we have a plastic system. So what is neuroplasticity? It's actually our nervous system's ability to change both its structure 
and its function. And when it comes to pain, that sometimes will be a change for the helpful side, for the adaptive side. I may have started to use my core more to splint my back, and that could have been a good thing, or it could have led me more towards Mary's route where I've now over guarded and I've over splinted and I'm avoiding. So sometimes it's maladaptive, but it does have the ability to change back and forth both in this kind of superficial way of how we just look at things and deep into the center of our processing. So hopefully you can start to see how this mandala really encompasses our whole pain system. Um, and we surround it with the eight limbs as just ways for you to um, have tools to start to kind of come at each one of those petals from different angles and using things that as yoga teachers or, or even just mindfulness practitioners of movement, um, th those are already at your fingertips. So if we walk through just a little bit of a more specific example here. Um, so asanas, of course, is one of the eight limbs and that's the physical aspects. Um, so, so really the way that we present asanas in the book is about mindful movement. So any movement could be considered an asana. You don't have to be in a warrior three. You don't have to be in a handstand. You certainly don't have to be doing crow um, to be mindful of your movement. So if you are focusing on an intention, you're moving from that place and you're using your breath to guide you, you're doing an asana. Um, thoughts and beliefs or where our actual focus is, our mindful concentration or Awareness is dharana, which is one of the primary limbs as well. So that's also a place that really like the Buddha was telling us, this is a place that we have a choice. We can choose to think about our how we think, right? And to, to recognize what's helpful and what's not helpful. And then to regulate our emotions, we can look at them from pranayama, which is just our breath practice. There's a lot of great evidence out there showing that that pranayama or, or slow, deep breathing can affect how our stress system responds to stress. <laughs> um, and through mindful focused attention, which again is dharana and dhyana, which is meditation, which is the practice of being mindful, uh, we can start to kind of maybe alter our experiences just a little bit. So whether you've had pain in your life, or just physical sensations um, that have been around for a while. Let's see if we can bring that into an example in your forefront of your brain, keeping this parable of the darts along and we'll move on to a mat. Um, if you don't have a mat available, you can certainly move just to the floor or you can stay in your chair and join along. But we're gonna cross back over this bridge from headspace onto the mat and then Neve will take us into a practice into life. So we're just going to go through some very simple asanas or mindful movements. These are in no way meant to be a recipe for a specific disorder. It's just a way to get us to move and start to recognize, again, this idea that we started with, which is feeling a sensation, naming it that, acknowledging that there are oftentimes other things that come along with it, and just trying to separate the two. So if you'd like to join me, I'm going to walk back to my little mat here. And I'm just gonna lay on my back. If you're sitting in your chair, you can just maybe scoot forward to the front of your chair so you have space to bend over. Um, and let's just first, again, come back to your breath. Finding the awareness of your inhale and your exhale. And if we follow Nee's example of the pelvic tilt. Can you just simply rock the base of your sacrum or the lowest part of your back down towards the mat? And then switch it the other direction. So I'm gonna take the top of my sacrum towards the mat. Or if you're sitting on a chair, again, you're just rocking slightly forward, tipping the hip bones towards the thighs and then rocking back into a slight slump. So you can let your breath set the rate and rhythm of this movement. And then open that body scan 
awareness again. To just start to bring your mind's eye to any sensations that are present. Can we name them sensation or first start? And can we acknowledge that they may have some thoughts, some beliefs, some emotions, some other movement patterns or muscle activations that come along with them? And can we just separate that for a moment and name all of those things second dart? And then you can just rest your pelvis there in a neutral position. And again, sitting or laying on your back, just let your left knee come towards your belly and give it a little hug, noting any sensations that are present, noting what comes along with it, finding the space between the two. And then you can lower that leg down and repeat on the other side. Continuing to let your breath be full and gentle. If your thoughts wander to something else, try to bring them back to the scan of your body. You can release that leg. Take a pause just to feel what is here now. Name it a sensation. See what comes along with it. Name those the second dart. And then if you're on your back, you can move to bringing both knees in towards your belly. If you're sitting in a chair, you can just slide your arms down the inside of your legs to create a forward bend. Allowing your knees to be gently heavy in towards your chest or your chest to be heavy on your knees and feeling the sensations along the backside of your body. Scanning what's there. Noting that oftentimes we try to label these something specific. Stiffness, tingling, tight. They might come along with things like, oh, I should have been stretching more. Oh, I shouldn't have eaten that cake last night. But we're gonna take all of those thoughts, maybe the emotions of guilt that come along with them. We're gonna label those second dart and set them aside. So you can gently lower your feet back down or slide your hands back up and come back to a seated position. Coming back to the breath again, scanning your body now. Again, naming what is here. Just one more movement. We're gonna bring both knees over to the left if you're on your back, letting your right shoulder just fall heavy behind. And if you're seated in a chair, you can just take your left hand to your right knee begin to turn your ribs off to the right. Following this with a long, slow, deep breath. Acknowledging again, the sensations that are here. Maybe you wanna localize them. Right upper hip, right rib cage, left thoracic spine sensations. Dart number one. If something else comes along with it, it's dart number two. On the inhale, you can return to the center. On your exhale, take a little pause there. And when you're ready, you can shift to the other side. So knees would fall over to the right or your right hand would come to your left knee and turn the ribs off to the left. 
Maybe you wanna notice what's different from one side to the other. It's just a different sensation. It's a different dart. It's still our primary stimulus. If we add a comparison, stiffer, looser, more dull, those are all second darts. So for now, we try not to engage in those thoughts. We simply name them and set them aside. And again, we come back to the center. I'll let you take a couple more long, slow, deep breaths. And then if you're on your mat, you can transition comfortably back towards the computer screen. If you're in a chair, you can shuffle yourself back. And I see our computer has jumped ahead. So I'm just gonna come back here. <laughs> Technology sometimes has a life of its own. <laughs> so just to give a very simple um, overview of what we did there. Uh, we used again, just an asana practice, anchoring into our breath, using the mindfulness uh, parable of darts to give ourselves a focus and something to watch for as we move. So those are the, the outer sides of the mandala, the eight limbs, um, creating this input into the petals. The petals creating maybe a different input into our system, how we process, and potentially the center of the system looks more like you and less like a picture of pain. So I'm gonna turn things over to Neve now again, and she's gonna just walk you um, one step off of our mat and how you can take this into your daily life. Thanks, Marnie. And we're kind of coming to towards the end of this presentation. So we're just gonna do this fairly quickly. Um, it is a visualization and it will build on some of the things that Marnie has done. But um, I would invite you if you find this helpful to really take this into life over the next few days or the next few weeks and, and, and become curious and explore it further. Um, so maybe again, just take that comfortable seat drop your gaze or close your eyes and just settle into your breath for a moment. But we should be there already, I guess, um, from the work that we've just done. And this time I'd like you um, maybe to, I'd like to invite you to think about an activity that you find maybe more challenging, an activity that is this, you would associate with your pain or discomfort. If you, don't have pain or discomfort, maybe it's a, an activity that you find challenging. So I'd invite you to think of something that's a, a practical day-to-day -day thing, like if, it's, if you've got knee pain, it might be walking down the steps, or if it's back pain, it might be emptying the dishwasher. If it's something more challenging, maybe it's a challenging physical activity like the handstands or something that, that Marnie referred to. And for the next few moments, just visualize yourself doing that movement, that activity. Maybe bring to mind a sense of what that physical experience feels to you. And then let's go through the second dart kind of exercise again. So as you visualize doing that activity, what can you peel apart in terms of first arts and second arts? What emotions or thoughts or comparisons creep in, appear, are subtly there in the background that you can now become more aware of? And I'll give you a moment to maybe do that visualization so you can have the experience a couple of times. starting to separate or disentangle the first dart from the second dart. And I'd invite you to just label them like that. What's first dart 
one second, don't worry. Now, what if you could let that second dart go? What if you could put that second dart aside, allow that emotion or that thought or that comparison to just let it go? Can you visualize that activity again and have a sense of that experience without the second dart? And then when you're ready, gently opening your eyes and coming back towards the screen. So like I say, with that, really the invitation is to explore it in a more practical sense and become curious about it over the next, next few days, next few weeks, if you choose to do it. And of course, the value of the marriage in it is seeing if you can separate those second darts and practice that. Um, and with that practice, is where we where lies the change. Okay, let's summarize. Um, here are some roots that we'd like you to to take home. Um, the pain is a full experience. It's not just about sensory input. And while we have a system that gives us warning signals, we they're not pain signals per se. It takes our, how we think and how we move and how we emotionally feel to come together to give us this bigger experience. Our nervous system is plastic and that's amazing because it helps us learn and it, it keeps us really safe, but it has a downside as we can see from some of the things that we've talked about today. Um, and so what we're always trying to do as people who are trying to move beyond pain or trying to help others move beyond pain is target that neuroplasticity in a really positive way. Um, I'm passionate about evidence, so I'm going to finish on a little note to the evidence or a nod to it. Um, and there's more references here, so you can come back and, um, and, and have a look at those in your own time. But just briefly that the evidence for yoga and pain care tells us at this point that we can have positive effects on pain and disability and mood. Um, and some of those effects are quite small, but nonetheless, um, they, they are positive. Just to say that the evidence base is growing and that lots of the studies that are out there at the moment are a bit limited in terms of maybe their sample size or the comparison groups or the length of follow up So watch this space. The evidence may change um, um, and we need to keep abreast of that. The next slide just has a, a bunch of references on it. <laughs> if you'd like to do some more delving, here, here it is. And um, I'll leave it at that. Um, and all that's left is for me to say thank you very, very much for participating um, so far. And um, I welcome your questions for the discussion part. Thank you. Thank you, Neve and Marnie. Uh, we have questions that are very relevant to uh, yoga, pain, and daily life in life. So the first question, if weather and daylight influence pain and how we experience pain, what suggestions do you have for pain management as we move into winter? <laughs> okay, I, I think that's uh, to me, <laughs> uh, knowing that I live in Alaska and this is a big thing that we deal with here. Um, I play oftentimes with another Buddhist uh, philosophy called real but not true. This is also outlined in the book. And so we can have these real experiences that our pain is growing because our external environment is shifting. And that makes us think, think that things inside of us potentially with this injury or process that we're dealing with has gotten worse. And that's when we start to suffer because we are afraid that all this work that we've done to get better isn't making us any better. And so we separate just like a first dart and the second dart. What's real? I don't feel very good. I feel like I'm a little bit worse. What's not true? I've done something to actually get worse or because it's cold outside, I'm worse. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is put on an extra jacket, keep your body really warm, get yourself some extra light and get outside. <laughs> 
So I don't have all that much more to add to that. I think those are great nuggets of wisdom, Marnie. Um, um, I would say that light bit is really crucial, right? So um, I'm going to take the, uh, uh, the science side of that and go, um, sleep's really, really important for pain. And um, uh, ex exposure to daylight early in the day is really crucial for melatonin um, and regulating our melatonin. Um, so that's going to be very important for our sleep and, and to sort of maintain good circadian rhythms during a time when it can be so easy to go, hey, I'm not going outside, I'm going to wrap up in my cozy quilt and have a pajama day. Um, uh, so I think some of the things that we do, we go back to the science and go, you know what, there's, there's some nuggets from the science that help us with pain care here too, and um, that will help us and help our mood. Yes. Before the next question, because the next question will um, uh, require some, some deep answer. Before the next question, let's just take a look at the slide that shows um, how the participants can uh, receive your book and um, also get in touch with you. So Handspring is offering a 25% uh, off on this beautiful book Pain Science, Yoga, Life, Bridging Neuroscience and Yoga for Pain Care. And here on the slide, you can see the, the code that you use for offering to receive free shipping in the USA and in the UK. And you also see um, how to get in touch with Neve and with Marnie on their website, painscienceyogalife.com, how to email them and how to be in touch with them on social media. We'll just note that our next event, which will be Wednesday, November 18, is with Josephine Key, a physiotherapist based in Sydney, Australia, who's written the book, uh, Freedom to Move, Pain Therapy for Spinal Pain and Injuries. Now back to the experts at hand, to Neve and Marnie. And the next question we have, the, uh, the questioner says, I also suffer from back pain and I know there is no magic bullet, but if you had to identify the top three things we could do to reduce and manage chronic pain, what would they be? So, um, yeah, so it's a, a, a multifaceted question, right? Um, there is no magic bullet. That is, that is definitely the key thing. Um, when we look at the evidence, exercise comes out time and time again as the most effective um, uh, treatment or intervention for lots of persistent pain conditions from arthritis to back pain and the only one that's been shown to reduce recurrences so finding a path uh, back to exercising regularly is really key and i think that's where movement therapists and physical therapists can really help in in guiding people towards that um, you'll see from our mandala that we're really looking at multiple dimensions. And so I think if we think top three, I think the next bit is about actually looking at each individual's um, experience as they, you know, uh, in terms of what's contributing to their pain and then taking a multidimensional approach. So taking things like if sleep's a, a real issue, then looking at, at, um, at practices that will facilitate sleep. Um, if mood's a real issue, looking at that and, and building um, kind of a multidimensional pain care model. And again, there's some early evidence that um, that some of these approaches, for example, uh, in, in back pain, are, are really um, more effective than if we take kind of one or two different types of intervention. So Neve covered that really well. Um, I think in the book, we use the quote, um, be your own medicine. <laughs> so that is really in reflection of exercise, movement, looking at your own thoughts and beliefs and emotions and harnessing what you can self-regulate. Um, and when we talk about exercise specifically for um, persistent pain, especially I think persistent back pain, you know, we're not talking about high intensity interval training or going out to run a marathon. We're talking about just 
learning how to move um, with mindfulness and not too much and not too little and really recognizing um, where in our body uh, we might be carrying um, extra tone and tension that's helpful and when it's not helpful. So I'll just echo, I think the top three, if we have to put it like that is um, movement, the idea of exercise. Um, and the second, get a team <laughs> approach so that you have experts who can help lead you through. And the third is really being honest and starting to learn yourself and trying to bring yourself the core of you back into your pain picture instead of it being mostly about pain. The next question comes from me and has to do, I would love to hear a discussion uh, from you regarding uh, the, the experience and the perception of pain through the lifespan. How a pain uh, might change the brain pharmacy in childhood or in the adolescence, middle life and into the older age. I might let Neve take this one um, first so she can lean into what she knows about the evidence of that. I would say, um, you know, from my experience in the, in the clinic, um, it, isn't, it isn't just about age, but where we are in our life and what else is happening around us. Um, so just with that little thought, then I'll, I'll see if Neve has some more to answer. It's, um, it's a really nice way of transitioning, actually. Riley, thank you for that. Um, I think there's often a perception that pain gets worse as we get older. And, um, and most of us feel a bit of that, right? Like we, we feel a bit more achy and I, you know, I, I certainly, um, you know, can, can sense that like my body doesn't do some of the things that it did in my mid twenties, 20 years later. Um, that said, when we look at pain across the lifespan, um, some things actually peak in mid adulthood. So like we think of something like back pain and actually peaks um, in, in middle adulthood. So this idea that we get worse and worse is not necessarily true. And I think it's really interesting when we start to look at um, some of the evidence around imaging. So there's been a huge um, effort to collate lots of findings on things like um, arthritis on scans and uh, you know imaging of back pain and go, well, what's normal and what's, um, what's associated with pain and disability? And there was a big paper that came out last week on um, hip uh, or lower limb arthritis and showing that even people with very severe arthritis on imaging on their scans didn't necessarily have a lot of pain. So we see these pictures get a lot worse as we get older, like our skin and our hair <laughs> gets worse as we get older, but not necessarily the pain and disability that goes with it. So what else is going on in our lives is really crucial. I would say a few things though. Um, there are, there are Kind of, um, I've become increasingly interested in in um, early childhood and its influences on pain and, and and pain and stress sensitivity. So there's certainly a good body of work that shows us that um, early life stress, maternal stress, early life stress, um, you know, trauma in early years in those formative years is crucial in in um, shaping and molding how our stress systems work and how our pain responses are. I'm very conscious of this as well in how I parent and when Freya falls over and my reactions and, and trying to measure those reactions in terms of an appropriate caring response and a bit of a, but not being too flippant about her bumps versus um, over, over protecting her and, and cuddling her and, you know, try to find this, this, create this balance, which I know is a challenge to every parenting exercise, but how we, how we behave in our homes in response to pain and um, matters. Um, interactions with our spouses, with our partners and so on matters. And so the two extremes where we almost have avoidant punishing behaviors um, in response to people's pain, or we're overly care kind of caregiving in our, we're solicitous it's called, but we're overly kind of protective and I'll do that for you. Oh, don't do anything, I'll do it for you. Those extremes actually feed more pain. 
So I hope that gives you some kind of insight into some of the um, literature that's out there and some of the insights that's out there um, in terms of pain across the lifespan. Maybe I'll just Thank volley you. it back again. Um, and uh, Marnie, and, I, I beg your pardon, because yeah. we have uh, we have two uh, two pithy questions uh, to fit in in the next five minutes. Let's so do let's do. Uh, from Doretta Hegg comes, pain is an unpleasant sensation and emotional experience per medical science. So are you saying here it's only an experience? Maybe I read that wrong. Um, literally, yes, uh, the pain, the word pain is the experience. So the physical sensation, um, that kind of starts to feed the experience is nociception. So we gleaned over that a little bit today. Um, if you want to know more about it, it is, uh, quite well written out about in, in the literature out there, both in the scientific world and more in the books that are appropriate for um, the average individual, and of course in ours as well. Um, but that the, the, the key point there is that pain is an experience. No susception is a sensory input from our periphery. That's our, those, the, the fibers that Neve was walking through. So it's nociception is our body's way of telling the brain that potentially we're under threat. And how our brain decides based on lots of other integrated factors, if we are or aren't under threat is what puts out that now experience of pain. I hope that helps. I would only add to that by saying it's an, sometimes when we talk about pain as the output or the response, it can sound like we're diminishing it in some way. It can sound like we're, you know, it's only an experience. It's only that output. And that's not what we're saying at all. In fact, I think what we're leaning in to appreciate is that it is, it is and can be much bigger than that. It can be and, and often is much more of a, a fully lived experience. Um, it's not just a sensation. It's not just a taste. It's, um, it's, it can and often is much, much more than that. The upshot of that, though, is that we can and often have much more control over it because we can peel back some of these layers of the onion and start to uh, maybe address more than we once thought was possible. Doretta Head thanks you. And now from Sherry Borman, how do you speak to patients who say yes to pain science, read it, and yet for their pain, they aren't applying. They feel unable to apply the information uh, to themselves. It's, isn't it isn't it often the case um this is the knowledge translating into into the mat onto the mat and into lives right that um sometimes we know things and we don't necessarily apply them and we see this all the time in like in any health behavior change or behavior change i know i should give up smoking but it doesn't really apply to me on a friday night when i'm out with my friends um, I know I should exercise more, but it doesn't really apply to me when it's windy and rainy outside and actually I've got to cook supper for, for my family. So um, oftentimes I think about where people are in terms of readiness for change. Um, and sometimes if there's really, um, they're in that, in that what they, they call the pre-contemplative stage, um, my job may be just about giving information. It might just be about sowing some seeds. I'm meeting somebody where they're at. If it looks like we need to go further, I think the key thing is um, experiential practice, right? Like I think it's, it's one thing for me to talk about the pain science, but actually in the clinic room, I have to go, let's try moving differently. What happens when you do that? Let's try this breathing exercise. What happens when you do that? Um, I had a lady yesterday where we talked to, she had upper back pain and, and really severe upper back pain. And we did a breathing exercise and so, but it doesn't change anything. 
And then I talked her through the Buddhist parable. And I said, well, because we, we still have to explore some of her first darts. Like we, ha we, have, we have some investigations to, to get and to see what's going on in terms of that primary input, the physical aspect. So I told her the Buddhist parable and I said, so can you see, so we went, well, can you see that maybe we're about shifting the second dart? And that was a more comfortable space to be in. So I think the experiential practice is key and then thinking about meeting people where they're at. And sometimes it changes and sometimes it takes another person to um, feed, that, feed into that. Speaking of meeting people where they're at, um, Marnie has a, a patient coming soon to her practice and she needs to shovel the snow away <laughs> from the door. So, so Marnie, we will... Um, I'm watching the time and you told me the, the time, the 15 minutes after the hour that you need to be picking up that snow, sh snow shovel. So we'll take this, <laughs> we'll take this next uh, question from the chat uh, to you first. Um, okay. So after 20 years of daily pain, can I get to a place where my experience of the pain is relieved? I believe the experience of the pain can be shifted. Um, if we if we put our mind's eye into the only way that it's relieved is if it is totally gone, that could set us up for a much more difficult, uh, more inclusive struggle. But I do believe that the pain can be shifted no matter how long it's been present. If we look at uh, Neve's example of other um, kind of gentle behavioral changes, you know, we can be um, addicted to cigarettes for 20 years and we can still make small changes to shift that addiction. And I'm not saying that pain is an addiction by any means, but it kind of takes that same gentleness and um, decision that we're going to look at which one of those pedals we can start to um, kind of feed in a really positive way. And um, yeah, I guess I'll just finish it with that, that there is lots of hope and it can be shifted. Yeah, she says, I understand, thanks so much. Um, I, I would add to that, that I have a 20 year history of pain that shifted. So I have, I had persistent pain from my mid teens um, right through to my mid thirties. Um, and as a physio, I had for probably a big chunk of that dealt with it from a physical aspects perspective. Um, and I was very, maybe I was one of those people that was really into the science. Hey, I had done a PhD on the pain science, um, but I wasn't quite applying all of it to me. So maybe I'm a good example of the person who wasn't quite there yet. And it took me um, being honest and getting some of the help that I needed um, to process some of the other aspects that were contributing to my pain, to get real about my sleep, <laughs> um, to, um, you know, to, to delve deeper, be honest, be kinder to myself, stop pushing so hard. Um, it took me looking at a lot of those different aspects. Um, and I have, I have the odd ache and pain, but I don't think I have much more than a, an average Joe at this point. Um, and I certainly don't have my persistent pain that I had for 20 years. So I hope that gives you hope. Hope, she says, hope. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. wonderful. Have you, and we also have a comment from the chat, Thank you so much for the idea of working with people on some other discomfort to learn there, to be with them there, and to give them the experience of seeing and feeling a shift. Can I just say that is the beautiful thing that yoga offers us. The real root of yoga is the um, yoking and studying of ourselves and how we interact with the environment around us from our body, from our spirit, from the way that we connect. And so if you don't take anything else from yoga, you can take that, that it's about getting to know yourself. And sometimes when we study anything, we need help. So it's okay to ask for a guide. With that, with Marnie and Neve, thank you both very much. We encourage 
everybody to delve into their gorgeous book, Pain Science, Yoga, Life. Thank you so much for having us, Elizabeth. Um, it's been a real honor. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you for everyone who has tuned in today or has, is listening later. Um, you're not alone on this journey. We're all here together.